Hi, podcast listeners. This is Leslie Law, your host for Sandbox Radio. This episode was recorded at ACT Theater in Seattle on New Year's Eve Eve, December 30th, 2016. It features a poem by Sandbox Radio staff writer Scott Augustin, musical guest the drunken tenor Rob McPherson, accompanied by Catherine Stromeyer on piano, a performance by Willie Weir, a story by Kurt Vonnegut, the Angels of Mercy Gospel Choir from Showtunes Theatre Company, and more, with the Sandbox Radio Players, and music from the Sandbox Radio Orchestra, led by guest music director and composer Angie Louise. So, sit back and relax as we take you into the world of Sandbox Radio Live. Sandbox Radio Before that, I was at the Daily Sticky. And before that, I aggregated content for Hype Stank and reviewed mobile tech and streaming for Gizmodo, WizFreak, and FreakWiz. Wow! You've been at this a long time. Yeah, six months. Going on seven. <laughs> but trust me, Newsix.com is the place to be right now. We get more shares per impression on Facebook alone than all those other sites put together across all platforms, including WonkSnap and Plubby. Gideon, have you seen Kate and Kate? I think they're with Kate. Are you coming? Zara wants everyone there. Yep, we're on our way. She said everyone. This is a big deal. Kate! Where's Kate and Kate? Who is that? Kate. <laughs> West Coast Digital Innovation Editor. There are seven Kates, and they're all in new media and West Coast digital innovation. Except Kate, who is our West Coast digital innovation editor, East Coast. They all spell their names differently, so it doesn't get confusing. Are you nervous? Your first pitch meeting. A little. Uh, more excited than nervous. It's going to be a whole new world here at Musix. Since the election? Uh, around here, we call it the neglection. <laughs> but yeah, Zara is going to want to hear our freshest, boldest, and hardest-hitting ideas. What do you think, Yom? You ready? I'm ready. How about you, Jenny? I'm ready, and it's pronounced Janai, actually. <laughs> Janai. <laughs> O-M-G, I am so sorry. Everyone does it wrong the first time. No excuse. I'm an idiot. No, don't worry about it. After you? Oh, I'd prefer not to subscribe to outdated gender roles in dictating the order of doorway passage. <laughs> Apologies. Check yourself, Gideon. It's okay. Allow me. Hey, everyone, can I get your attention, please? Eyeballs up front, please. For those of you I haven't personally met, I'm Zara, executive editor here at Newsix, the online journal of news, culture, identity, and ideas. Because... It's not just the news. It's the music! Awesome. I want to just take a quick minute to welcome a couple of new faces to the room. Yom, our new intern on the fifth floor. Hi and welcome. Hi, Yom. And our new content specialist for politics and culture, Janai. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, ma'am. Please. 
Only my mother calls me ma'am. <laughs> People, our country's worst nightmare has come to pass. For over three whole years, we here at musics.com have dedicated our professional lives to bringing the most important stories to eyeballs across the planet. But today, it's a whole new Game of Thrones. We can no longer hold anything back. We must meet this national tragedy with every weapon at our journalistic disposal. We have to fight with our minds, our hearts, and our convictions. We have to stand up to those who would run roughshod over our democracy and show them they cannot stamp out the progress we have made. That is why we are here. Not just click-throughs, not just shares, not just cost-per-impression ratios. We are here to shine light into the darkness, to bring power to task, to expose evil where it festers, and bring to justice the very people who would try to keep justice from us. We are the future, not only of journalism, but of this nation. And we will never stop. Who is with me? <laughs> How about it, Janai? Why don't you kick us off? Oh, well, uh, I've been working on, on research for a two-part story that ties his flagrant tax evasion into his attempt to defraud the thousands who enrolled in his bogus university. Hmm. Okay. I, I think that is a, a feature, but then we have to go after the money. A weekly, no, daily series on how the wealthy game the system so they can file bankruptcy after bankruptcy and still be rich, how they can run American industry into the ground, sending millions to food banks, sending thousands to their graves, and, and never have to pay a price for their actions. We profile these guys one by one until they are exposed. Okay, Janai, that's fine. I get you're new here. I'm going to come back to you, okay? Give you another shot after we've gone round a little bit, okay? Oh, I... Starting? I... Yes, Zara. What you got? Bar soap. What's wrong with bar soap? Um, it's gross and people who use it are garbage people. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Give me 500 words and work in how it makes you throw up in your mouth just thinking about it. Got it. Gideon, got a headline for me? Uh, the dark and sordid history behind America's obsession with cranberries. Just in time for the holidays. I want 1,500 words by the end of tomorrow with photos of them floating in those bog things. Zoom in and desaturate a little so they look like they're ashamed of themselves. <laughs> cranberries? Who's next? How the Rubik's Cube ruined a generation. How? How what? How did it ruin a generation? It was too hard. <laughs> and? So you pull the stickers off, basically making you a cheater. For life. That stigma doesn't go away. Bring it home. It's a throwback to a nostalgic monochrome fantasy of something that you thought was fun, but it wasn't really fun because it was actually something bad that you didn't know about till now. Nicely done, Ian. 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 <laughs> 750 words. These are all good ideas, people, but I need something that is going to disrupt people's daily lives. But the new president's cabinet is going to have the most combined wealth of any administration in the history of the office. Cass, uh, what are you working on? <sighs> I have finally convinced a couple of my sources to go on record. Let's hear it. Socks with Crocs. Oh, here we go. It's an abomination. Still being in this old drum, are we? Wearing black or blue socks with injection-molded foam resin footwear is an affront to every single one of us. White socks are no better. They're worse. These dads, and let's just face it, it is dads we are talking about here. These same dads, these same dads, who walk around the house all Saturday morning wearing cargo shorts and calf length cotton tube socks pushed down to the ankles with their camo pattern squishy slip-ons. These same dads climb into bed on Saturday night, 
slide over to the middle, nestle into the big spoon, and petition for a little something-something from their wives? What is up with that? It's offensive! Disgusting! Repulsive! Not all dads. Oh, please. I'm just saying. Please. Really, Bill? Are you really going there? I'm just saying not all dads wear Crocs with socks. Stop trying to control the Croc narrative. Stop trying to shame people over things they honestly can't do anything about. Okay, you two. They can take off their socks, Bill. They can take off their damn socks. Bill. Then their feet get sweaty. Can I just explain something to you? They get sweaty feet. This, this is what I'm talking about, Zara. This is the problem. Bill. While we know that not every dad wears Crocs with socks, we also know that everybody who wears Crocs with socks is a dad, okay? (laughs) Thank you. Right now, all you are doing is derailing discussion of an issue that is literally tearing our nation apart at the seams. That's it. Tearing us apart at the seamless. The emotional case against Crocs with socks. (gasps) This is why we do this. It's where all the best ideas come from. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I I don't... Don't be sorry, Janai, be bold. Can you see what we're doing here? We launched Newsix.com with three simple self-help articles aimed at new mothers. That series, no matter how you raise your kids, you are ruining their lives forever and annoying the rest of us. (laughs) Followed up with... You are a bad parent, just admit it. (laughs) And the third in the series, okay, seriously, how you are raising your kids is ruining the world. (laughs) Was shared over 10,000 times and secured us our very first online Scoldy Award. (laughs) Is it safe to say we made some people uncomfortable with that series? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We did, but we moved the important conversations forward. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say we pushed the needle of progress a little bit. But we can't rest on a shelf full of scoldies, Janai. We need to bring this new administration to task at every turn. The new administration? Yes, that's what I was talking about. We need a snarky name. I mean, really snarky. Kate? The bad administration. Nice. Kate? The sad ministration. I like. How about you, Kate? Ad suckestration. Hmm. Kate? Ad menstruation. You will hate that. Ah, good, good. Kate, what do you got? The Whitey McWhiterson Super Big Shot Mr. Man Fun Time Show? <laughs> That's it! Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Get that down to Roya in graphics. <clears throat> Janai. Uh, Are you sure Newsix is the right place for you? It is. I... I think I have one, Zara. Let's hear it. Sitting is the new smoking. (laughs) Didn't HuffPo already do that? Yeah, a puff piece about how a sedentary lifestyle isn't good for you. Tell me something I don't know. But what about secondhand sitting? Uh, uh, yesterday, I-, I saw some people sitting on a bench downstairs, like right next to the door. I walk into a room, I see everyone sitting, and I think, oh. I'm going to sit, too. It's insidious. What about the kids? What about the kids? They're is sitting on TV. They're sitting in movies. It's, it's, it's everywhere they look is sitting. Uh, apparently, some people still think they have the right to sit inside. Yeah, garbage people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it's a new world. Let's just make sure we go after what matters, okay? Let's get out there and make everyone as uncomfortable as we are soon going to be. Yeah! Yeah! And 
now, another installment of Platitudes from the mind of Peggy Platt. When we reach the end of the year, it's natural to jump to the next new thing. We all do it. What did I do? Where did I go? Who did I vote for? Too soon? <laughs> I'm usually too nostalgic and too sentimental. I forget the reasons for looking back should be to take stock, to learn from and avoid last year's mistakes. I am also kind of a hedonist. You know, the here and now. I'm a I've got no 401k grasshopper rather than an I know my tsunami path to safety ant. <laughs> when I do take stock, I say, oh, <laughs> that sucked. <laughs> I know, I'll run headlong into the next thing. <laughs> the next relationship, the next year with total abandon, like ramming bumper cars. Bumper car behavior is best suited to people with only themselves to crash into the next new thing, <laughs> i.e. the bumper car carries only one person and never a baby car seat. <laughs> In fact, aside from normal chick baby pangs, I've never regretted my decision to pilot my own craft. No crew, no kids, to try to be a good Auntie Peggy to my brother's kids and now their children. When the 17-year-old estranged daughter of my partner Bill showed up on the doorstep of our cluttered, overcrowded, one-bedroom apartment that we share with four cats. <laughs> to live. No notice. I freaked out. <laughs> Or, as a dear friend of mine says, I buckwheated. <laughs> I let out an audible scream. <laughs> Eyes popping out of my head. And 21 hours later, I was a step whatever. I'm not married to her dad, so there's no term for the chauffeur, cook, nurse, confidant, giver of unsolicited advice, gal, pal, and disciplinarian I've become. This year alone, there was high school into college, shopping and cooking and deep truths and shallow lies and sickness and hurt feelings and angry rants from all of us, uh, and hundreds of miles driven, thousands of texts sent, two and a half boyfriends, 19 breakups and makeups, <laughs> one court appearance, two funerals, three <laughs> Christmas stockings, endless negotiation, endless baggage, literally and figuratively, and the really unexpected part, endless joy. So I guess I did good this year. We did good. As a family, a flawed, screwed up, alternative family, but a real family. When I look back on this year, I will take stock. I will try to improve my temper, procrastination, and fiscal responsibility. <laughs> but I will also think of the laughter and the hugs and the fart jokes and the hairballs and the casseroles and the YouTube poops and couch snuggling with episodes of Once Upon a Time and Lucifer and capturing Pokemon and braiding her hair and no regrets about my time as a step whatever. After all, tomorrow is another year.
Caterpillar's Dilemma by Scott Augustson. <laughs> Sometimes when I say, I am so sorry, that must have been difficult for you, I give you my raw sympathy. Like a mother bird, I am dropping a worm of sympathy into your mouth. I am rubbing a soothing balm of sympathy into the open wound of your grief. I say all of that kindness, but what I want to say is, really? How awful. Why don't you pull up a chair and tell me everything? Spare me not a single detail. I am not now, nor have I ever been squeamish, not in the least. Tell me, when they cut out your mother's cancer, what else did they remove? Did you get to keep it in a jar? Did you take a selfie with the scar? When your lover left, did he tell you why? Did he make it perfectly clear how unlovable you are? When you said accident, what was it you meant? Automobile, industrial, overdose. Did she die at the scene or in an ambulance on the way to False Hope Hospital? <laughs> Were you secretly glad in the small shabby corner of your small shabby soul when they died? Breathe a sigh of relief at your light and glow. Splurge on a pedicure. Did you wait for Helen the hospice nurse to slip out for a smoke and then help hurry along the hand of death? Was it ugly? Was it expensive? Did you wake up at 3 in the morning, 3 a.m., and just cry? And just out of curiosity, did your father throw all of his left shoes in the trash? Or did he seek to find them a new home, another foot for his sinister sneakers? <laughs> These unasked questions I don't dare to voice. I'm not gloating. I'm not gleeful. I'm not some buzzard bestride your broken body. Your pain does not entertain me. It isn't your pain at all that fascinates me. It is the change. How did you survive? Why did you survive? Did you survive? I need to know. Because change is coming for me. And I'm at a loss to handle the loss that comes with change. My arms are already full of the grocery bags of life, and people are strapped to my back, and there is a basket balanced on my head. I don't have a hand free to hold the loss. God is always closing doors and then opening windows. But life is not a house, and there is no God. If you go to Facebook on any given day, you will see scoldy box after scoldy box telling you to embrace change. And there is a butterfly, not a real butterfly, a clip art or a JPEG of a butterfly, the very icon of change, as if a caterpillar tired of crawling about said, yup, it's time, and then climbed into its cocoon for modesty's sake and put on a pair of beautiful fashioned forward wings like you or I might slip on a rhinestone jacket. It doesn't happen that way. Once the cocoon has been spun, the caterpillar's body betrays. It releases enzymes that begin to break down the caterpillar's flesh. It dissolves in what surely must be an agonizing process, like a corrosive shower from within. Only thing, when everything of the old is gone, only once it is but a sticky gray goo, unrecognizable, indistinct. And have I said sticky? Only then can the butterfly be built. The caterpillar never gets to meet the butterfly. And what if, after all that loss and indignity, what emerges is not a gorgeous, magnificent monarch? What if it is a powdery, disgusting moth? <laughs> Seems to me, when it comes to change, there's 10 ways to go wrong for every right. <laughs> Who'd take those odds? Only a sucker. So, the hour is late, and I am just going to ask you, who have been dismembered by metamorphosis, rendered unrecognizable by catastrophe, bathed in the swimming pool of sorrow, stripped of everything you thought could never be taken from you, broken to bits, you sit here today reassembled, smiling, 
Yeah. And is that a new sweater? It looks great on you. <laughs> you have made it through the tunnel, or so I think. So. My question is, was it worth the price? Was it worth the fuss? There may be no going back. But there is also no obligation to go forward. And uh, gentlemen, <coughs> uh, um, uh, welcome to the symphony. Uh, the, the, the drunken tenor is poised to sing the flower song from Bizet's Carmen. I love it. It's one of my favorites. While he's known for months that he is supposed to sing it, he has neither practiced the flower song, <laughs> rehearsed the flower song, no, nor truly even knows the flower song. But in the grand tradition of theater, uh, the show must go on for some reason. And now, the drunken tenor. Yeah. 
this offer it ends soon. from Kurt Vonnegut. and everybody was finally equal. They weren't only equal before God and the law, they were equal in every which way. Nobody was smarter than anybody else. Nobody was better looking than anybody else. Nobody was stronger or quicker than anybody else. All this equality was due to the 211th, 212th, and 213th amendments to the Constitution. <laughs> and to the unceasing vigilance of agents of the United States Handicapper General. Some things about living still weren't quite right, though. April, for instance, still drove people crazy by not being springtime. And it was in that clammy month that the H.G. men took George and Hazel Bergeron's abnormal son, Harrison, away. It was tragic, all right. But George and Hazel couldn't think about it very hard. Hazel had a perfectly average intelligence. Which meant she couldn't think about anything except in short bursts. And George, while his intelligence was way above normal... Had a little mental handicap radio in his ear. He was required by law to wear it at all times. It was tuned to a government transmitter. Every 20 seconds or so, the transmitter would send out some sharp noise to keep people like George from taking unfair advantage of their brains. And this... A buzzer sounded in George's head. His thoughts fled in panic like bandits from a burglar alarm. That was a real pretty dance, that dance they just did. Huh? That dance. It was nice. Yep. George and Hazel were watching television. There were tears in Hazel's cheeks, but she'd forgotten for the moment what they were about. On the television screen were ballerinas. George tried to think a little about the ballerinas. They weren't really very good. No better than anyone else would have been anyway. They were burdened with sash weights and bags of birdshot, and their faces were masked so that no one, seeing a free and graceful gesture or a pretty face, would feel like something the cat drug in. George was toying with the vague notion that maybe dancers shouldn't be handicapped, but he didn't get very far with it before another noise in his ear radio scattered his thoughts. George winced. So did two of the eight ballerinas oh. who collapsed to the studio floor. Having no mental handicap herself, Hazel had to ask George, What was it? Sounded like somebody hitting a milk bottle with a ball-peen hammer. I think it would be real interesting hearing all the different sounds, all the things they think up. Only, if I were handicapper general, do you know what I would do? Hazel, as a matter of fact, bore a strong resemblance to the Handicapper General, a woman named Diana Moon Glampers. If I was Diana Moon Glampers, I'd have chimes on Sunday. Just chimes, kind of in honor of religion. I could think if it was just chimes. Well, maybe make them real loud. 
I think I'd make a good handicapper general. Good as anybody else. Who knows better than I do what normal is. Right. He began to think glimmeringly about his abnormal son, Harrison, who is now in jail. But a 21-gun salute in his head stopped that. Oh. Boy, that was a doozy, wasn't it? It was such a doozy that George was white and trembling and tears stood on the rims of his red eyes. Why don't you stretch out on the sofa so as you can rest your handicap bag on the pillows, honey bunch? She was referring to the 47 pounds of birdshot in a canvas bag which was padlocked around George's neck. Go on and rest the bag for a little while. I don't care if you're not equal to me for a while. George weighed the bag with his hands. I don't mind it. I don't notice it anymore. It's just a part of me. You've been so tired lately. Kind of wore out. If there was just some way we could make a little hole in the bottom of the bag and just take out a few of them lead balls. Just a few. Two years in prison and $2,000 fine for every ball I took out. If you could just take a few out when you came home from work. I mean, you don't have to compete with anyone around here. You just sit around. Well, if I tried to get away with it, then other people would get away with it. And pretty soon we'd be right back to the dark ages again with everybody competing against everybody else. You wouldn't like that, would you? I'd hate it. There you are. The minute people start cheating on laws, what do you think happens to society? I reckon it'd fall all apart. What would? Society. Wasn't that what you just said? Who knows? It wasn't clear at first as to what the news bulletin was about, since the announcer, like all announcers, had a serious speech impediment. Ladies and d- 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 ladies and gentle <laughs> ladies and d- 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 shit. That's all right. He tried. That's the big thing. He tried to do the best he could with what God gave him. He should get a nice raise for trying so hard. He handed the bulletin to a ballerina to read. She must have been extraordinarily beautiful because the mask she wore was hideous and it was easy to see that she was the strongest and most graceful of all the dancers for her handicapped bags were as big as those worn by 200 pound men. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for my voice which is a very unfair voice for a woman to use. Excuse me. She began again, making her voice absolutely uncompetitive. Harrison Bergeron has just escaped from jail, where he was held on suspicion of plotting to overthrow the government. He is a genius and an athlete, is under handicapped, and should be regarded as extremely dangerous. What are we going to do? A police photograph of Harrison Bergeron was flashed on the screen, upside down, then sideways, upside down again, then right side up. He was exactly seven feet tall. (gasps) Nobody had ever borne heavier handicaps. He had outgrown hindrances faster than the HG men could think them up. Instead of a little ear radio for a mental handicap, he wore a tremendous pair of earphones and spectacles with thick, wavy glasses. Scrap metal was hung all over him. In the race of life, he carried 300 pounds. To offset his good looks, the HG men required that he wear at all times a red rubber ball for a nose. (laughs) The photograph of Harrison Bergeron on the screen jumped again and again, dancing to the tune of an earthquake. My God, that must be Harrison. The realization was blasted from George's mind instantly by the sound of an automobile collision in his head. And when George could open his eyes again, a living, breathing Harrison filled the screen. I am the Emperor. Do you hear? I am the Emperor. 
Everybody must do what I say at once. Clanking, clownish and huge, Harrison stood in the center of the studio. Ballerinas, technicians, musicians, and announcers cowered on their knees before him, expecting to die. Even as I stand here, crippled, hobbled, sickened, I am a greater ruler than any man who ever lived. Now, watch me become what I can become. Harrison tore the straps of his handicap harness like wet tissue paper. Tore straps guaranteed to support 5,000 pounds! His scrap iron handicaps crashed to the floor! He thrust his thumbs under the bar of the padlock that secured his head harness. The bar snapped like celery. Harrison smashed his headphones and spectacles against the wall. He flung away his rubber ball nose. <gasps> and revealed a man that would have awed Thor, the god of thunder. <gasps> I shall now select my empress. Let the first woman who dares rise to her feet claim her mate and her throne. A ballerina arose, swaying like a willow. Harrison plucked the mental handicap from her ear, snapped off her physical handicaps with marvelous delicacy. Last of all, he removed her mask. She was blindingly beautiful. Now, shall we show the people the meaning of the word dance? Music! Harrison and his empress listened gravely, as though synchronizing their heartbeats with the music. They shifted their weight to their toes. Harrison placed his big hands on the girl's tiny waist, letting her sense the weightlessness that would soon be hers. And then, in an explosion of joy and grace, into the air they sprang. Not only were the laws of the land abandoned, but the law of gravity and the laws of motion as well. They leaped like deer on the moon. The studio ceiling was 30 feet high, but each leap brought the dancers closer to it. It became their obvious intention to kiss the ceiling. They kissed it. And then, neutralizing gravity with Love and pure will, they remained suspended in air, inches below the ceiling, and they kissed each other for a long, long time. It was then that Diana Moon Glampers, the handicapper general, came into the studio with a double-barreled 10-gauge shotgun. She fired twice. And the emperor and the empress were dead before they hit the floor. Diana Moon Glampers loaded the gun again. She aimed it at the musicians. Uh, uh, you have ten seconds to get your handicaps back on. It was then that the Bergeron's television tube burned out. Huh. TV's on the fritz, I guess, George. George? But George had gone out into the kitchen. He came back in with a can of beer, paused while the handicap signals shook him up. Uh, and then he sat down again. You've been crying? Yep. What about? I forget. Something real sad on television. What was it? It's all kind of mixed up in my mind. Forget sad things. I always do. That's my girl. Ah, ah, ah. Gee, I could tell that one was a doozy. You can say that again. Gee, I could tell that one was a doozy. <laughs>
Take me to the picture show The only place I wish to go When life betrays us the end is cold But I don't care inside the show I don't care inside the picture show If you love me, you'll buy me a ticket and settle beside me just like you were mine. When the lights go down, we won't care what they're doing outside. When the dark surrounds us and curtains. Slide back like the lids of an eye And I'm inside the picture show With my third wish I wished to go When life betrays us the end is cold But I don't care inside the show I don't care inside the picture show Sandbox Radio. Subscribe to the podcast in iTunes and Stitcher and help other people find us by taking a moment to leave a rating or review if you would. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest news on our upcoming live shows. 
Now back to the show and the Angels of Mercy from Showtunes with music director Nathan Young on the piano. Yeah. 
by Lisa Halpern. Smells incredible. <clears throat> what you making, Joe? Turkey and a few other goodies. Mmm. Let's hope it tastes as good as it smells. Your creations are always delicious. Hey, you're wearing the apron I got you. Are you kidding? I love it, Lulu. I am the master baster. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, I couldn't resist wearing it. I figured it would drive your dad batty. Everything drives him batty. He drives me batty. Oh, hi, my little babies. Who came up with that saying? What saying? Driving me batty. Why isn't it driving me elephanty or hippopotamusy? Or... Maybe it's because bats fly around in wacky, weird ways that are hard to follow? Do they? I don't know, but it sounds plausible, doesn't it? Sure, why not? Can I ask you a question? Of course. Your dad drives you batty. He drives me elephanty. So why exactly are we having him and his girlfriend over for dinner? For that matter, why are we having the entire family over? It's sure to be the opposite of good times. We've been over this. Tell me again. We've been going to your family's house for Thanksgiving for how many years? Fifteen. Right. And how many have been train wrecks? Fifteen. Exactly. <laughs> And how many Christmases have we spent at my dad's house? Fifteen, and yes, all nightmares. Okay. So, this year, we skipped Thanksgiving at your mom's and celebrated with our friends. How is that for you? Best Thanksgiving of my life. <laughs> Me too! And skipping Christmas with my dad and spending it with our friends was the best holiday I can remember since... Maybe ever. You speak the truth, woman. And the only reason we got away with that was because I came up with this idea for the new and improved family holiday, the New Year's Feast. You're clever. I've always thought that. Takes one to know one. So, we have to deal with both families at the same time, but it's worth it, right? Right? <laughs> only time will tell. Hey, where's the scotch tape? I don't know. You say that about everything, and everything that is ever missing from this house ends up in one of your piles. You love my piles. I love you. Now think. When was the last time you used the tape? I didn't use the... Oh, wait. Uh, I made a poster for the Battle of Baristas last month. Ha! I knew it. So, use your wooden spoon as a divining rod and go find it for me. You're pushy for someone so small. You're forgetful for someone so cute. Aha! Victory! We have the tape, and we are not afraid to use it. Thank you, Herr Hopcap. We are pleased at this outcome. So what you making? Oh, no. Anytime you tape a piece of paper to the fridge, it means a new system of chores. This never works, Lulu. This isn't that. Oh, good. What, so what is it? Write your name on the left-hand side. Awesome. Now I'll write mine. I wasn't born yesterday, honey. This looks suspiciously like the beginning of a chore list. It's not, I swear! Catch! Ah, hello kitty stickers. Cute. What are they for? This is our new super secret stress system. Our what? It's like a game. My therapist suggested it. Last year, your therapist suggested that you tell my mom when she's crossed the line. That was a great suggestion. <laughs> I mean, just because your family pretends she's not nuts doesn't mean... That's not fair, Lulu. Come on! She did it again. Last time she called, she said, How's your mom, Lulu? Well, that's called being polite. It would be if my mom hadn't died two years ago. There is that. Well, your dad has some interesting quirks. That's a nice way to put it. Which one do you like best? Oh, I like the fact that every time he sees a celebrity somewhere and says hello to them, he magically transforms the exchange in his mind into a deep friendship. That's not fair. He's Last time he saw us, he said he was besties with Barbara Streisand. He didn't say besties. Okay, but seriously, what is up with that? You know, he's always loved strangers. More than, well, anyone. Famous strangers are like a double jackpot. 
<laughs> I love you, honey, but I don't want to play this game. I'm gonna mash the potatoes. Honey, you just... What? Humor me, please. Just put the stickers in your pocket. If it sucks, we can stop. Oh, all right. Here's how the game works. Every time one of our family members does something inappropriate or pushes our buttons, we can just casually make our way to the fridge and put a sticker under our name. I don't get it. We'll count the stickers at the end. Whosever's family is the freakiest wins. That's not fair. Sure it is. I mean, my family is pretty wackadoodle. You're telling me. See? It'll be fun. Is there a prize? Yep. The winner gets treated to dinner at their restaurant of choice. You know what would make it really fun? What? The winner gets to decide what we do for Thanksgiving next year. Ooh, me likey. Deal. Hey, is something burning? Oh, crap. Uh, it's not burnt. It's just something on the grate. Great. And I'll just you know, take this opportunity to baste it because I am, after all, the master, the master baster. baster. Ooh, the gravy's boiling. I'll just give it a stir. Oh, don't touch that. Ah, we're there now. Aren't holidays fun? I have a system. I was just trying to help. Well, how about feeding the cats? They keep circling, making me nervous. Right, the cats are making you nervous. Mm. They're, They're here. here. <clears throat> smiles, everyone, smiles! <clears throat> Who is it? Coming! Let's hook you a Oh! Hey, oh, 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 I gotta freeze oh, all the floor! Oh, 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 everyone I could have at the once! Now. Sticker! Sticker. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. Come on in, everyone. Oh, oh, <sighs> <sighs> Hi, Dad. Mom. Hi! Merry Christmas! I mean, Happy Hanukkah, Lulu! Happy New Year! <laughs> Happy New Year to you, Mary. What's with the crazy apron, Joe? Point for me. So, Dad, how are you? Great. Spent some time last week with my old buddy, Tony Bennett. Where? The airport. <laughs> that one's mine. Yep. <laughs> how are your cats? <laughs> Fine, Mom. Sticker. Your house looks nice. Is that a new painting? Nope. Been there since we've lived here. Did you lose weight, Lulu? Nope. Pretty much the same as usual. How's your mother? She's, She's still dead. dead. Oh my God, Mom. What is the matter with you? What? What? What did I do? Just once. Could you try to just be aware of the people around you? Oh, look at you. You think you're such a big shot now. A little respect, huh, Joe? How about a little love? Yeah, that's awesome. Coming from you, Harry. Did you know that when Lulu was nine, she was obsessed with the Chronicles of Narnia? What? Exactly. You have no idea what's going on in your daughter's life. You never have. She was reading the Chronicles of Narnia the year you and her mom broke up. And what happened in that magical world felt way better than what was going on in hers. She spent her Saturdays waiting for you to come pick her up. You'd call hours later saying you weren't going to make it every week. She wanted to go live in Narnia so badly, she went outside every day for weeks, faced east, as the Chronicles of Narnia clearly said you had to do, raised her arms ceremoniously and chanted, Aslan, 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 but he didn't show up either. She's been waiting her whole life for you to show up, man. It doesn't take much. Ask her what's going on in her life. Listen when she tells you. She's an amazing human being. Everybody knows it but you. I never taught him to be so rude. If you weren't a grown man, Joe, I'd have a mind Step to... back, lady. <gasps> You're in my house now. You are a narcissistic nightmare. If you were my mother, I would have walked away from you years ago and never looked back, let alone invite you to my house. This gentle soul, your son, somehow managed to grow into the most open-hearted person I have ever met. And you haven't even noticed. You should thank your lucky stars that someone as wonderful as Joe even wants to spend time with you. How dare you? How dare you? I love you so much, Lulu. You are my favorite person in the whole world, Joe. Are you two on the marijuana? <laughs> Let the games begin. Oh, yeah. I'm going to get there what? first. No, I'm going to put first. all my stickers on right now. My way. Thanksgiving in Hawaii? Just us. What's with the stickers? Thanksgiving at home. PJs, mac and cheese, and a stack of old movies. I like this game. 
I love holiday games. Whose team am I on? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Willie Weir. Way off the beaten path in Alabama, close to the Mississippi state line, a young boy turned and yelled back into the house, Daddy, you ain't gonna believe this! There's a man in bicycle britches on our porch looking for a place to camp. That was me in the bicycle britches. I've cycled around the world in a whole lot of places. South Africa, Cambodia, Colombia. I pedaled my bicycle in Bosnia when the only other vehicles on the roads were tanks and troop trucks. Yet, when my wife and I announced that we were gonna pedal our bikes in the Deep South, our friends and many of our acquaintances announced, oh, your most dangerous trip to date. And I realized at that point that I knew more people that had traveled in Southeast Asia and South America than had traveled in the Deep South of the United States of America. Daddy, well, Todd Skinner was his name. His friends call him Skin. And his wife, Kim, came to the door. Todd announced, I wouldn't let a stray dog camp in that weather as he looked out at the cold drizzle. Kim showed Cat to the shower while Todd led me out to where we could sleep, his large garage workshop. He stoked a metal barrel-shaped stove to take the chill off while I cleared a space for our mattresses and sleeping bags not far from the stove and near a muddy, knobby, tired ATV. Before supper, we were treated to turkey calling. Uh, see, Todd's son was headed out to hunt turkeys the next morning. I didn't know this, but you know, turkey, wild turkeys are quite large. They're huge, but they're actually really hard to hunt. And the best thing to do is to hide in the woods before the sun comes up and call for them and wait for them to come out. Well, Todd's son demonstrated and his friend a bunch of apparatus they had, and one was this incredibly expensive piece of plastic that you put in your mouth and then you blew and hum at the same time to make the sound of a turkey while the other was actually a couple of well also extremely expensive pieces of wood that you rubbed together uh, and that made approximately the same sound and I am standing there thinking why would anybody spend that kind of money to sound like a turkey and to dress in camouflage in the dawn's early night. Well, I realized that at that same time, that kid was looking at me and thinking, I don't know why anybody would spend that kind of money on a vehicle that you had to pedal and you had to get up before dawn to get anywhere. Well, after Kat and I had both showered, we spent the evening as guests at their table eating the best deer stew east or west of the Mississippi, and drinking enormous glasses of sweet tea. Todd was raised not far down the road by a daddy who quit work every year come hunting season. He's taken up his daddy's passion, hunting and running deer with his 11 walker hounds. He's a granddaddy at 37 years old and works with his wife Kim at the paper mill 30 miles away. His sister is as mean as a snake, he'll tell you, but she'll do anything for you if she likes you. His world revolves around his family, his land, and the woods. But he's most alive when he's out in those woods, stalking a deer with a bow or listening for his hounds. I looked across that table and I thought to myself, we are as different as night and day. I mean, he lives in the country, I live in the city. He voted for George, I voted for Al. He hunts for deer, I hunt for discounts at the grocery store. <laughs> he drives a two-ton pickup truck, I ride a 25-pound bike. In our everyday lives, we never meet. Yet, there we were telling stories and laughing around the dinner table. 
Dinner broke up about 9 p.m. Kat and I headed out of the garage to hit the sack, and Todd and Kim climbed in their truck to hit the road to arrive at the mill for their night shift. Jobs are scarce in the small town in Alabama. Most folks drive 60, 100, 200 miles round trip to get to their jobs. Before Todd left, he took me aside and he says, it's fixin' to rain all day tomorrow, and you don't need to be riding those bicycles. You stay as long as you want. Your guests here. We snuggled up in our sleeping bags, close to the warm glow of the stove. At 5 a.m., I opened my eyes as my dream-clogged brain tried to piece together where I was. Rain pounding on a tin roof, the smell of hay and grease, the swaying silhouettes of Bradford pear trees through a workshop window, the yelp of a walker hound. I was deep in the deep south. Todd and Kim arrived back home around 9 a.m., inviting us in for breakfast, and then they went to bed. But not before Kim fixed us up with more coffee and sandwiches for lunch. We spent a cold, drizzly day in our makeshift guest house, reading, writing letters, and relishing the simple pleasure of being cozy and warm and dry. Our routine established, we came in later for another home-cooked supper and swapped stories until Todd and Kim left for the mill. The next morning brought partially cloudy skies and no rain, and we packed up our panniers somewhat reluctantly, and we went in for breakfast. And after we'd had our fill of pancakes, I went out with Todd out to the workshop. He'd asked me to help him out. He needed some hay put up on the truck to head, head out for his cows. And I will tell you something. Riding a bicycle is great for your legs, but it does absolutely nothing for your upper body strength. <laughs> and as I try and to lift one of those bales of hay. I looked up at Todd, I said, Todd, you know, I really think if, if, if I'd been born here, I'd been a farmer or, or a hunter. And he grabbed that bale of hay as if it was nothing. And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, and you know what, Willie? If I'd been born in the city, I'd probably been a bike rider. <laughs> Is everyone here? What's going on, Dr. Vestigial? Friends, we have a problem. Nothing that the Vestigial gang can't fix. That's right. What evil lurks today? The Vestigial gang. Once regular citizens, they were altered by Dr. Vestigial, who took one useless body part from each of our heroes and, using his genius, enhanced and improved the organs before returning them to their owners. They awoke from their ordinarily routine surgeries as... Gallivanting gallbladder at your service! Telekinetic tonsils ready for action! And... The Avenging Appendix! Look out! Together they've become a fearless band of superheroes who fight the forces of evil. Today we find our heroes huddled around Dr. Vestigial, who has some alarming news. It seems that our old nemesis, Metaphoria, has escaped. Not Metaphoria! I thought she was locked up, as locked up as a fly in ember. That's Sinister Simile. Metaphoria broke free two days ago. But how can you be sure? Turn your eyes to the screen on the far wall. We interrupt our regular broadcast to bring you this breaking news report. Thanks, Stu. I've never seen anything like it. Apparently, the victim, Mr. Bob Smith, was driving along when he was cut off by another car. A witness heard him yelling, I had the right of way, you jerk, and then... Can you tell us what happened next? Then he honked and yelled, Oh, I'm boiling mad. And then he was, he was literally boiling. And there you have it, straight from an eyewitness. Mr. Bob Smith has died of boiling madness at the scene. Now back to you. 
That sounds just like Metaphoria. This just in, a man on Cowell Street was sitting down to watch the game. All he said was, I just want to be a couch potato today. We are unable to show you the graphic images of root vegetables resulting from this. Sounds like she's getting around. A man at the First National Bank just got hopping mad at the teller, and he's crashed his head through the ceiling. Rumors are swirling that the evil villain Metaphoria might be behind these attacks. Stay tuned for the latest updates. We have to stop her. And fast. Vestigial gang, it's up to you. But how? Metaphoria always outsmarts us. We've got the brawn of our enhanced vestigial organs. If only we also had the brains. There's no time for wishing now and no time to waste. Never fear. I'll douse her with my bionic bile. I'll extend my tonsils, hold her in their powerful grip, and give her strep throat. I'll surround her and make sure she can't escape. I have 25 pieces of old chewing gum just waiting to keep her company. Ooh. Ew. Let's go! Oh, ah, oh, excuse me. Ah, oh, watch it. Ah, shotgun! Ooh. Careful what you say. Excuse me, watch me. Look! Over there! Looks like that woman's been crushed by a huge, huge Doberman! Help! What happened? I was just standing here minding my own business, re remarking on the weather, and, and, and. You didn't say. I said it's raining cats and dogs. <laughs> It was awful! Ow! Were you hurt as well? No, I only got a scratch when this ginger cat fell on me. Meow? Yeah. This pain is my darn wisdom teeth. They've been hurting me for weeks. They're just killing me. Stop! Don't say it. Your teeth just really hurt, okay? Okay. Ow. So, your wisdom teeth hurt. Huh? I don't know why we even have the darn things. We don't need them anyway. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Say, have you ever wanted to be a superhero who fights the powers of evil? Of course. Then, this is your lucky day. I can enhance those teeth. They can come out, but they can also go back in. This will only take a second. Right in here. Ooh, ah, ah, watch it. Oh, right, you're giving me that hurts. <laughs> Numbing agent. Numbing agent. Pliers. Pliers. They're out. And. They're back in! <gasps> now, fellow crime fighters, let me introduce you to... Wisdominant! Wow, I feel great. In fact, I've never felt smarter. Let's see. I've calculated the various trajectories of Metaphoria. According to my calculation, she is headed... Yes! That way. No! Yes! But that's... On top of the mountain? The edge of the cliff. The end of the road. Yes, we have to hurry. Hold it right there, Betaphoria. Oh, it's the vestigial gang. This is the end of the road. You'll never catch me. Oh, yes, we will. No way. You're useless. Not anymore. I'll get you with my bionic bile. Oh, gross, gallivanting gallbladder. Take that. Watch out! She's deflecting my bile back toward us! Duck! Whoa! Whoa! I'll squeeze you in my tonsils! Take that, Metaphoria! 
Uh, get your disgusting telekinetic tonsils off of me. Get her avenging appendix! Stand back while I surround her! Never! Oh my goodness. Oh, what is it now? Oh my, in the sky, it's, it's, I don't believe it. What? It's nothing. Nothing? Don't you see it? All I see is a blanket of clouds. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> Good one with the blanket! With it! it. <laughs> Keep fighting! She's getting out! Keep fighting, but watch what you say. <laughs> Try as you might. It's really hard to stop saying metaphors. What do you mean? Well, once you get going, you just can't stop. It's, um, it's a... It's a what? Oh, good grief, it's a slippery slope. Gotcha! Oh, oh, you! The Stigilga! Watch out for that sea at the bottom! There's no sea down here! Ah, it's very sad! Oh, don't be so dramatic! It's so sad! It's, 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 it's what? A sea of despair? Damn it! Curse you, the Stigilga! You did it! Yeah, I did! Welcome to the Vestigial Gang. Until next time. Let's hope Sinister Simile doesn't get out. We'll be as busy as bees if she does. Oh. <laughs> 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 The place, Seattle, Washington. The year is 2050. Fifteen years ago, in the summer of 35, a small local online retailer invents time travel for the sole purpose of being able to deliver packages to their customers before the customers even order them. <laughs> the technology works, but the return process is thrown into chaos. When customers, instead of returning items they don't want, simply don't order them in the first place. This creates several tears in the fabric of space-time, warping whole neighborhoods and creating our fair city's most famous landmark, the Lenin Troll Needle. Time travel is swiftly outlawed by the Sissy Pants Anti-Innovation City Council. And you all know the rest. When time travel is outlawed, only outlaws will travel through time. That's where I come in. I'm what they call a doc. When someone makes a temporal sidestep and screws something up, I make it all better. With the help of my young apprentice, Miss Molly Mercer, we make sure the history of Seattle stays in line and on time. The past can be a rowdy place. And besides, we'd all hate it if things turned out differently, wouldn't we? This week on Doc and Mercer, The Viaductine Follies by Elizabeth Heffron. Marla! You rang? Yes, what time is it? Searching. Two minutes after the last time you asked. Very funny. Where the blazes could she be? Traffic on the Trump Way is stage four red, sir. Well, nothing holds Molly Mercer back from a time travel assignment. Locate her GPS position, won't you? Located. She's parking. She'll be right here. Doc, I'm here. Sorry I'm late. Thank God you made it. What's the wrinkle this time? It's that old speed demon, Willie the Wheel Wear. You don't say. I thought we'd poked his spoke after that last Pronto bike share uprising. Well, looks like he's back in the quantum saddle, Molly, and rolling straight for us. Alert. Big alarm. Temporal waves approaching. Whoa. Whoa. What's happening? Hang on. Is this an earthquake? Uh, not exactly. Something far worse. How big was that one, Marla? 6.3 on the Richter. It's that Weir fellow. That do-gooder keeps traveling back and trying to make this town more livable. We've got to find him and reverse the damage. But, Doc, don't we want... No, Molly, even good intentions can cause big headaches in the future. That wasn't an earthquake. It's a metaphysical recalibration. By God, the city of Seattle is ripping itself away from the rest of the state. But why would we want to stop that? <laughs> Quick, 
<laughs> Molly, we gotta catch the wheel before he strikes again. What year, Doc? 1948. Fire away. Ladies first. The floor recognizes our new Department of Highways director, William Budge. Mayor, all I can say is Railroad Avenue is an absolute disaster. Trains, trucks, cars, fish. It's gridlock, I tell ya. Look, where you been, Budge? It's 1948. We already built the seawall. Now that street's called Alaskan Way. Just blend in with the crowd, Molly. Easy for you to say they're all men. Pull your cap down and look constipated. <laughs> oh, wait. I see Madame Seance over in the corner. Let's go stand by her. We can't leave it to the Seattle process. We've got to get off our duffs and do something about this situation now! Yeah. Quiet down. So what do all you whiz kids have in mind? Oh, I have just the solution. Paul Theory, you have the floor. Let's build a tunnel. Oh. Oh. Why do all you smarty pants architects always float the weirdest ideas? But it would be a super highway under the city. They shot that turkey in 1911. A bunch of commie nutsos on the council back then. <laughs> Mayor, I say we're Americans. We deserve something big and blocky. Yes! Yeah! Something that says we won the gosh darn war, so just see if you can stop us. Something that will carry 110,000 vehicles a day. Yeah! Yes, yes, but what? Boys, what we need is... A viaduct. Viaduct, 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 viaduct. Ooh, big word coming from that cowboy city engineer, Ralph Fink. What the hell's a viaduct? A streamlined, double-decker, elevated highway that would run high above the muck and squalor of the city. Oh. Madam oh Seance, God. I see you there in the back. Madam Seance, should we proceed with this viaduct? What do you see for our future? Hmm. Let me ask the cards. Hmm. I object. This is no way to evaluate public policy. <laughs> yeah, sit down, Paul. Why do all you architects have to be such wet noodles? I see... A glorious opening ceremony in April 1953 <laughs> with vintage cars. <laughs> and Mayor Pomeroy is there. Hey, that's me, riding on that float. And, oh, the Seafair Queen. Oh, hello. Hi, everybody. Wow, it's pretty darn high up here. <laughs> I see Ivar Haglund, flounder of Ivars, and the king of the waterfront. Keep clam, everybody. <laughs> and, uh, oh, what's this? The legendary dog sled musher Leonard Seppola in a sled pulled by eight Alaskan huskies. Mush! Yes, yes, I am famous enough to be standing on this viaduct. It was me who rushed the diphtheria serum to Nome in 1925. I bring you now a giant pair of fake scissors. He hands the scissors to the Seafair Queen for the ribbon-cutting ceremony, and the mayor says a few words. This viaduct will lead to even greater things. Perhaps one day to one-way streets and more. The Seafair Queen snips the ribbon across the roadway. And the vintage cars rumble off down the viaduct. <laughs> It's 
all I see. <laughs> this whole deal is completely half-baked. I move we pull the trigger on this concrete miracle! Yeah! Uh-oh, Doc. Looks like we miscalculated. This all seems to be matching the history books. Patience, Molly. I believe I hear the wheel approaching now. What the heck? Daisy, Daisy, give me our answer, do. Gosh, oh wow, I think I got here in time. Sir, what is the meaning of this? Mayor, sir, and all of you awesome people of Seattle, I beg you to reconsider this next step you take. Oh boy, here he goes. I mean, if you really think about it, we here in Seattle have the opportunity to be on the cusp of something incredible, something multimodal and extreme. What the heck is this guy talking about? Did you know that right now, in 1948, 56% of all the people who work downtown take public transportation? Did you know that? I mean, that's like, wow. Yeah, so? That's like astounding. That's like, in the foreseeable future, you could lead the nation towards an environmentally green and awesomely pristine landscape. But you go and you build the big ugly because that's what it's going to be called. And you won't see those commuter numbers again in your lifetimes or mine. I told them about the tunnel, Willie. I mean, look at me, would you? I'm riding around on a miracle on two wheels, the last innocent form of transportation. Heck, it's good for you. It's good for the environment. Keeps your appetite up. People eat more clams. Hmm. Could bring in more tourists, Mayor. Gosh, he's persuasive, Doc. I kind of wish No, that... no, don't let him get under your skin, Molly. Next time he wheels by us, we grab and transport. Well, here he comes. Gosh, like, just imagine what the waterfront would look like. Now, if we Molly! Just... Yeah! Ow! Ah! Gosh, why did you have to pull me out now? I almost had them. Exactly. You know very well, Willie, that too much enlightenment leads to enlightenment poisoning. We're having awful metaphysical recalibrations in 2050. The city is pulling itself away from the state. Now, you can't be messing with the past like that. But I can't stand by and watch people make the same mistakes over and over. Please, don't take me back to 2050. I gotta try and help. Doc, I've got an idea. That's worth considering. All right, Molly, as being we're working on our gender equity and our working relationship, we'll try it your way. Yes. Mr. Weir, if you really want to change something, we're going to drop you off here. Here? Where's here? Make America great again! Make America great again! Oh. Oh, wow, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if even a bicycle could fix Farewell, that. Farewell, Willie the Wheel! Do whatever cyclic magic you can. Donald, Donald, give me your answer true. Approaching 2050. Well, Molly, another future averted. Nice work. Yeah. Hey, what's wrong, kid? I don't know, Doc. Sometimes I wonder if the wrinkle would be better than... Than what? Where we are? That way lies madness, Molly. Who are we to change the fate of mankind? But someone like Willie almost did it. Well, you never know. Maybe we'll actually get there on our own. Maybe, Doc. That's the spirit. Now, come on. Let's go over to Dick's and get a Macklemore burger and fries. <laughs> All right. But we scan your arm this time. Absolutely. Still need a tie to get in that place? <laughs> My treat! <laughs> You're listening to Sandbox Radio. This one was for Hillary. I want a girl with a mind like a diamond. I want a girl who knows what's best. I want a girl with shoes that come. 
cut and eyes that burn like cigarettes. I want a girl with the right allocations who is fast and thorough and sharp as a tack. She's playing with her jewelry. She's putting up her hair. She's touring the facility and picking up slack. I want a girl with a short skirt and a long Oh yeah! Everybody? Ready? You know what to do. I want a girl who gets up early. Gets up early! I want a girl who stays up late. Gets up late! I want a girl with uninterrupted prosperity who uses her machete to cut through red tape with fingernails that shine like justice and a voice that is dark like tinted glass. She is fast and thorough and sharp as a tack. She's touring the facility and picking up slack. I want a girl with a short skirt and a long Chuck Leggett. Liquidation. Liquidation. I want a girl with good dividends. good dividends. At Citibank, we will meet accidentally. accidentally. We start to talk when she borrows my pen. She wants a car with a cup holder armrest. She wants a car that will get her there. She's changing her name. Sean Bellier, Jason Moore, Dr. Sean John Walsh, Megan Ayers, and Richard Simon. <laughs> and I'm your host for Sandbox Radio, Leslie Law. <laughs> Let's hear it for Rob McPherson, the drunken tenor. <laughs> The great Willie Weir! And how about that sandbox?
Fox Radio Orchestra, Dan Tierney on drums, Michael Marcus on the bass, Charles Leggett on harmonica, and uh, Sean Bellier on the trumpet, and on the keys. On the keys, our special guest, maestro, and composer from the love markets, Angelique! <laughs> Lisa Halpern, Elizabeth Hepron, Peggy Flat, Julie Waller, Cruzon, Kurt Vonnegut, and Wayne Raleigh. Our stage managers were Susie Butler, Chicago Collis, Nakano, and Amanda Ray. And this show was recorded by Brian Moynihan, sound engineered by Max Langley, and lit by Pam O'Kern up there in the booth. was recorded in front of a live audience at ACT Theater. It's written by Scott Augustin, Lisa Halpern, Elizabeth Heffron, Peggy Platt, Juliette waller Prezan, and Wayne Raleigh. Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut was adapted for radio by Richard Zyman and myself. The show was sound engineered by Max Langley, recorded by Brian Moynihan, and this podcast was mixed by Dave Pascal. Find out where you can catch more of Angie Louise and her band, The Love Markets, and how to buy their new CD, Beauty Factory, at AngieLouise.com. Dig deeper into the sandbox and find the recording archive at sandboxradio.org. I'm Leslie Law. And I'm Richard Zyman. And on behalf of all of us here at Sandbox Radio, thank you for listening.